ข้าสู่ห้องที่1เลยนะคะกลุ่มธุรกิจอาหารและการเกษตรค่ะขอเรียนเชิญผู้ดําเนินรายการคุณภูมิศิรประภาสิริเรียนเชิญท่านค่ะโอเคเกรดทั้งเกียวครับขออนุญาตเริ่มเลยนะครับขอขอบคุณครับคุณปลอยครับขอขออภัยอีกครั้งนะครับ let's just resume so food and agro that we know is a major source of human source of greenhouse gas emissions according to the FAO the UN Food and Agriculture Organization the food system as a whole is responsible for 18 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year and that is about 34 percent or more than one third of our emissions from human activities at the same time food and agriculture is a segment that has been already been uh, most affected by climate change, and it is also most vulnerable uh, to future impacts as well, right? In addition, uh, this is a segment that is full of opportunity for improvement and with a diverse set of solutions and technologies that can help us uh, mitigate both the sector's impact on climate and the impact of climate on the sector itself. So it is no surprise then that uh, food and agriculture has received worldwide attention uh, from the UN Food Systems Summit, uh, which GCNT hosted an independent dialogue for in July of this year, uh, joined by many of our members uh, uh, that are present here today, to the upcoming COP15 on biodiversity and COP26 uh, climate summit and beyond. Today, we are honored by our four panelists uh, who will be speaking about the solutions that the food and agriculture sector can offer in our collective actions to combat climate change. Uh, first, we have Kun Dan Patomwanit, Chief Executive Officer of NR Instant Produce, Public Company Limited. Next, we have Kun Ho Ren Hua, Chief Executive Officer of Taiwa Public Company Limited. Mr. Ole Henriksen, Project Director of Thai Rice Nama. And Kun Peter Pong Garin Chai, Executive Vice President of Engineering, Jeroen Pokapan Foods Public Company Limited. May I first invite each of you to introduce yourself your organizations and the key topics that you will be uh, talking about for today uh, in the following order for one minute uh, intro, please. Good, yes, good, good morning, um, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever wherever you are. So, 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 so uh, our company, we're, we're a listed company, we're a food manufacturer, very focused on how do you um, decarbonize the world with food um, or how do you system, sustainably produce food um, in a world um, battling against climate change and um, a population of 10 billion people. Um, you know, we're, we're doing multiple strategies um, with regards to that with one of the biggest strategies is our focus on alternative proteins as a key transitionary um, tool um, to enable this, tra um, this change to happen. Um, today I'll be speaking to, um, to, to all of you about our commitment to net zero. How do we plan to achieve that on, um, uh, you know, using, using this strategy? as well as our plant-based um, food model um, in which, you know, how does plant-based play a role in this transition? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Uh, next, uh, can I go to Mr. Ho Ren Hua, please, from Taiwan? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see all of you, and thank you for UN uh, and GCNT for organizing this. Um, Taiwan Public Company, we're based in Bangkok. Um, we have 15 operations around five countries. We operate today in Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, China, and Indonesia, primarily in the B2B ag and food space. So today I'll be speaking a bit more about our strategies and multi-stakeholder vision from farm to shelf. How we work with tapioca farmers, rice farmers, uh, mung bean farmers across the region, as well as a new initiative we have in developing the first range of tapioca-based bioplastics that we are rolling out end of this year. Uh, the operations for Taiwan very much have a regional perspective. So we do consumer food products, uh, food ingredients. And as Dan mentioned, I think it's an important need to catalyze innovation across the entire value chain in food and ag. So look forward to speaking and learning from all of you today. Thank you, Kap. Thank you, Kap. And next, uh, let's go to Kun Ole. Kun Ole, Kap. Yes, good morning, Kun uh, Pung, and good morning, everyone. Uh, great uh, pleasure and honor to, to join this uh, round table today. Uh, GIZ is a federal, uh, enterprise and service provider to the German government in the field of international cooperation. Our overall mission is to contribute towards uh, achieving the sustainable development goals. We have uh, supported the uh, partnership between Thailand and Germany for 60 years now, 
We are currently uh, working in the fields of agriculture, natural resource management, uh, energy, uh, urban and industrial development, transportation and healthcare. And uh, today uh, I would like to uh, share how we work with our Thai partners in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, rice cultivation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Captain Ole. And lastly, uh, let's go to Kun Peter Pong from CPF. Captain Captain Peter Pong, Cap. Uh, Cap. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Peter Pong Karin Sai, representing CPF. CPF is one of the largest um, agricultural and food producing in the world. And um, today, uh, quickly, I'm going to talk about CPF 2030 sustainability in action and mainly focus in the uh, waste and water and the climate change that um, the, the action that we have been doing uh, in order to reduce and mitigate uh, the risk to the world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, and let's uh, jump right in to the first round of questions. Uh, let me start with Kun Ole uh, from Thai Rice Nama. Uh, can you tell us how the Thai Rice Nama program is working to reduce emissions from rice cultivation, which is you know, a major a sector uh, for Thailand and the region, and also what kind of impact the program is having and how it can be scaled up? Mm, thank you. Uh, could I have the slides, please? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, let me just uh, start by saying a few words about the, the NAMA facility. It was uh, jointly established by the German and the British government in connection with the uh, climate change negotiations in Doha in 2012. Uh, relatively soon after that, also the German government and the European Commission joined the initiative. The, the vision of the NAMA facility is to uh, accelerate carbon neutral development through financial assistance to the implementation of national climate change strategies and uh, national determined contributions in uh, both developing countries and emerging economies. Um, and as we heard uh, earlier today, uh, in Thailand, the agricultural sector is contributing, is the, let's say, the second biggest uh, sector uh, emitting greenhouse gas emissions uh, after the energy sector. Uh, and uh, here, rice accounts for almost 60% of the total emissions from the sector. So, so there is really a, a huge opportunity for Thailand to contribute significantly to global emissions in this area. And it's on, on this background that uh, the Thai government, with assistance from uh, GIZ, submitted a, a proposal for a Thai rice a NAMA project. Uh, the main partners uh, in this project is the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, in particular, the rice department, it's ONIP under the Ministry of Natural Resources and it's the Bank of Agriculture and Agricultural Cooperatives under the Ministry of Finance and GIZ. Uh, next slide, please. Good. So the uh, overall goal of uh, of the Thai Rice NAMA is to uh, facilitate transformational change of the uh, of the uh, Thai rice uh, sector to a uh, let's say a low emission and sustainable uh, uh, production in Thailand. It's a uh, five-year uh, project with an 14.9 uh, million euro, which is uh, combined with the, the government of Thailand's uh, budget of 9.1 million euro. It consists of a combination of uh, 
technical cooperation and financial cooperation. It's our target to reach uh, 100,000 uh, farming households in six provinces in the Central Plains. And this uh, represents an area of approximately Gas emissions with uh, the equivalent of 1.7 million implementation period. Uh, next slide, please. Would our support uh, consist of uh, three components, where the first one supports uh, rice farmers in uh, adopting low emission. Uh, production practices, or what we also call uh, climate smart best practices. And here it's, it's important to, to understand that these uh, practices, they not only reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but they also improve resource efficiency, thereby reducing uh, input costs and increasing farmers' income, because that's, of course, a very crucial or the adoption of these practices. Uh, frankly speaking, a, a small-scale uh, rice farmer is not only concerned about the greenhouse gas emissions from their fields, but improving their uh, income is definitely agenda. Uh, we do this through a combination of uh, trainings and field demonstrations. The uh, investment, there are investment costs uh, associated with these technologies and therefore under the financial component we have established a revolving fund uh, which can uh, pre-finance these investment costs for the farmers. The second component uh, focuses on uh, to enable them to uh, provide the necessary mitigation services to farmers and under the uh, financial component we facilitate uh, access to BAAC's uh, green loan program so that they uh, can make the necessary uh, investments in uh, these technologies. Finally, we have a uh, a policy support component practices and also of course eventually scaling up these practices. And we also have a very close cooperation with the private sector partners. This includes uh, rice traders such as uh, Olam, Epo and Mars Foods in order to create a a market for a low emission sustainable mitigation technologies. We focus on uh, four technologies of which uh, alternate, what we call alternate wetting and drying is the most important one. Uh, simply put, uh, it consists of uh, draining the field or rather letting the field dry out between uh, one to three times per season as compared to having the rice field continuously flooded. And uh, this practice uh, alone can reduce greenhouse gas emissions with between 30 and up to 70%. The, the second uh, technology is laser land leveling, which creates a very uh, even and level field and uh, the two technologies, uh, well, first of all, this practice improves the effects of alternate wetting and drying. And the two technologies combined can reduce uh, water use with about 40%. It also increases uh, fertilizer efficiency and it even uh, increases yields. The third technology is what we call uh, site-specific nutrient management, where uh, farmers, they produce, uh, they apply fertilizers in uh, 
in accordance with the specific soil conditions and the specific rice variety that they are growing. These practices together can typically uh, reduce fertilizer application with around 20% as compared with the conventional practice. Finally, uh, we are uh, promoting uh, economic attractive alternatives to the very common and detrimental practice of uh, rice straw burning. So this, uh, this is a very, uh, let's say, brief introduction or overview to the Thai rice Nama. Uh, in regard to your second question, uh, how do we envision the scaling up of, of these uh, practices? And uh, well, overall, uh, as, as these practices, they uh, reduce uh, production costs and thereby increase farmers' input we expect that they will be scaled up simply through the market forces. Now, of course, uh, when that's said, uh, then we expect that they will be scaled up simply through the market forces. Now, of course, uh, when that's said, uh, then Often uh, there are certainly bumps along the way. Uh, this is especially true in regard to the, the laser land leveling. Uh, there are costs uh, associated with this technology. Uh, it costs around uh, 1,350 baht per rye. And while we have the revolving fund to so pre-finance these costs for the farmers, by the end, of the month, they have to pay for the service. Uh, they have to pay back the loan. Uh, and we, we, have, uh, we know that, uh, that here in Thailand, we have experienced uh, severe droughts during the last two years, which has resulted in that farmers, they have only been able to grow one rice crop per year as compared with the two crops uh, which they usually produce. And that means that they are very reluctant and very uh, wary of any in additional investments under these conditions, especially uh, with the, uh, let's say, with the uncertain uh, outlook for uh, climate, uh, uh, climate conditions during the coming years. Also, uh, the uh, service providers, they have to invest uh, in around uh, 8,000 euro in the laser land leveling equipment. And here, uh, service providers, they are often still hesitating to make the investment before they have seen a clear and strong demand from the farmer side. So, so here is the classical uh, chicken and egg discussion. What comes first? Uh, is it the supply or the demand? And as, as always, uh, these, uh, both supply and demand has to emerge uh, simultaneously. And therefore, we are also uh, in discussion with the NAMA facility uh, in order to discuss whether we could uh, introduce a time-limited promotional subsidy, both for farmers and service providers, in order to, to boost the adoption of, of this technology. But in the long run, uh, we certainly expect that uh, the scaling up will, will happen uh, through the market forces. Thank you. Thank I you so much, questions. Yes, I think that was very clear in what, uh, what you've been doing. And thank you so much for the work that you've been doing and also hoping to scale it up. Uh, next, let us move to Kundan from NRF. Kundan, so in uh, So in our instant produce, so NRF has joined the race to zero, committing itself to doing greenhouse. Also a second question, uh, the plant-based food uh, business model of which uh, NRF is a champion has the potential to transform the food systems, uh, particularly the protein sector, to be more climate friendly. Uh, can you also please tell us more about that? Thank you. Uh, take it away, Cap. Good day, Cap. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can share screen. 
Can I share screen directly? Uh, yes, you may. Can okay. uh, Um, let me start with the first one. So, uh, what, you know, when you know, f four years ago, when we first signed our our letter of commitment, um, and uh, um, and to join the global compact back in two thousand seventeen. Um, we viewed it more from a governance perspective, from a carbon. We wanted to be mission oriented because that was the way our, that's what our customers wanted. And that's where we felt the world was moving. But as we continue to see the pace of change that's happening specifically with respect to climate change, um, it, be, it then became, you know, this is, um, the world is going to move towards abatement, reduction, removal. And, and that was one of the most uh, profound things that we had had to tackle back in two. And so um, back in 2018, and, and then hence, you know, when we joined um, the Net Zero campaign um, in 2019 to 20, um, we viewed uh, carbon as a new S curve for our company. How could we use um, potentially carbon neutral and then eventually a carbon negative um, operation um, as a value proposition to our um, to our customers, as well as um, a, a way um, um, not just internally, but you know externally, whether they're shareholders, um, customers, suppliers, etc. And so, when we looked at kind of um, you know it's 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 easier when we look at an emissions perspective on how we. Um, you know, we can decarbonize our scope one and scope two emissions, but the, the Billy was on our scope three emissions, um, which is which is the indirect emissions that occur from our upstream components. Um, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. And so uh, our company, NRF, um, we're listed in, our purpose really is how do we decarbonize the world with food? And we view this um, as an intersection between kind of planetary health human health and basically decarbonization. And it's a symbiotic relationship, starting off with decarbonizing ingredients. So basically plant-based ingredients, and then fed into basically our supply chain, which is um, driven in um, around, uh, we incorporate the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals right into our, our supply chain. And then that supply chain feeds a network of garb, uh, uh, carbon neutral facilities around the world. Driven in, uh, manufactures um, products on an OEM and for our own purpose-led brands that eventually result into um, dis distribution. Now, so what does that mean? Um, I want to take a very clear example of, of what that means with an initiative we announced about a month ago. So thinking about how do we decarbonize um, our, um, our supply chain, we were thinking about trees. Um, and green carbon. And um, it's it's great, and we are still very much for a forestation. But then we started thinking about um, how could we also potentially use um, this as a means for plant ingredients as well. Chinton trees in basically decarbonization. as well as how do we decarbonize our um, supply chain using this kelp. And so um, what we came up with as a, as a solution, which I'll share um, in a bit, is, is that we, we turn the kelp into a high grade um, carbon fertilizer, which we then give right back into um, our supply chain, basically to our farmers. And so kelp, right, pulls the carbon very efficiently down from the air, right? Um, we convert that both into plant proteins and also into, we take that fertilizer and basically we're able to then validate that we, we've sequestered that um, high carbon fertilizer into the soil for 600 years, hence um, decarbonizing um, our supply chain. And so our, our business model 
um, is predicated on two parts of our business. So one is our carbon neutral business, um, which we do via offsets and being as efficient as possible. So for example, um, we've, we've, we've put solar on our rooftops. Um, you know, we're moving towards um, green energy to the extent possible. Um, and then there's our carbon negative business, which is basically our ingredients that remove carbon and then our products that also reduce carbon from the atmosphere, um, such as alternative proteins. And that all feeds into basically our, our, our three pillars of our, of our company, which is people, planet, and performance. <clears throat> so, um, you know, so going to, so to summarize, um, what we're doing in our operations um, is we've tried to become as, as efficient as possible with our operations. We've then, in summary, taken the issue of decarbonization or the problem of climate change and turn it around and say, how can we make a business out of that, right? Um, how can we improve profitability while creating competitive advantage around decarbonization? Um, and that's where um, our carbon negative um, business um, comes into play. And so in your second um, question, why, why plant-based, why alternative proteins? Um, why is it that uh, millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z are, are all about um, plant-based proteins, right? And so if we look at beef, for example, okay, um, it's basically, um, it, depending on kind of the product that you're um, consuming and you're comparing it to, right? A pound of um, soy protein uh, versus like a pound of beef, for example, right? Um, it takes 13 times as much land. 11 times as much water and generates 10 times the equivalent of CO2 emissions. Um, so soy is basically 10 times, uh, or beef is basically 10 times um, more pollutive from a carbon's perspective um, than basically soy protein, uh, which is why there's such a huge emphasis on um, the transition of meat, basic, specifically um, high carbon footprint meat, such as beef, right? And to transition that to alternative proteins. And so um, why is that very important in a broader context of climate change? And so if you look at this chart here, the business as usual for the food system, right, um, over the next 80 years, right, would still see that uh, we only have a 67% chance of limiting the world to two degrees. Now, if the world were to transition to plant-based diet, right, then we have a 50% chance of reaching 1.5 degrees, which is extremely important. And it, here you can see the different strategies that the world could take to achieve a 1.5 degree um, climate change prevention strategy, right? In which plant-based diets is probably the most efficient and easiest way uh, to get to that goal. Now, so our company going back, right, is, is, um, is, is based on how do we de decarbonize the world, right, with food and, and food system transformation. And so um, we believe that it's extremely transformative. Today, uh, meat, meat, uh, plant-based meats has penetrated 3.7% of supermarket aisles in the United States and probably about 4% in Europe. And that, um, even by the, the sea of carbon, um, is expected to reach 10% three primary areas. Um, the first area um, is um, around how do we accelerate plant-based consumption? The second area is around how do we do that without using more land and being as efficient as possible? And that is through regenerative agriculture. Um, and then the third is how do we do that in a most carbon efficient manner, and that is through decarbonizing ingredients. So one of the key strategies we're doing is we're essentially, we're building this global pl protein platform. And so we're building production centers around the world. Um, we already have one in the UK that serves Europe, and that's it's one of the biggest plant-based um, OEM manufacturing plants um, in Europe. Um, with 85,000 metric tons of capacity. Um, we also have labs um, focusing on how do we improve um, agriculture productivity, as well as how do we use waste stream potentially for energy. Uh, we're building a plant here in Thailand together with PDT Group, 
um, do, basically replicating the same thing. We're working with a group in China, and I'm actually just, to, we're going to announce soon a deal in the United States and North America to basically do the same. And so essentially what we're doing is that we're here to enable the transition to basically plant-based foods and upstream alternative proteins by supporting brands in their transition to a plant-based world. And so um, they will be able to manufacture their plant-based products um, in any region um, around the world, especially in, um, as, as, um, as difficult as say, 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 for example, in China, which is why tight integration um, into our um, vertically is extremely important from a decarbonization perspective. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about some of this pioneering work that we're doing from a decarbonizing perspective. So the first one I was, I was mentioning was um, our announcement with a company called Eastwater. And so a lot of that people ask us, why are we work, why is a food company working with a water, wastewater treatment company, right? And which is, you know, we're gonna be growing all this seaweed, um, hopefully tens of hundreds of thousands of tons of seaweed, right? And we're gonna convert part of that into um, plant-based proteins and the other part into material that sequesters carbon for 600 years, allowing us to sell carbon removal certificates. Um, and so that helps us solve for decarbonizing ingredients. But then how do we solve for efficient production? And so this is this very weird looking chamber that you see here. And then so we're really super excited. And I think this is where the future is going to go in terms of the world, in terms of food production. Um, we're going to see uh, distributed food production. Um, it might look like very mad scientists um, in, in a way, but we're going to look at distributed um, uh, manufacturing of um, alternative protein ingredients, um, both in a basically a cellular format as well as a plant-based format or a, um, basically via hybrid, uh, hybrid format. We're working with some of the coolest startups in the world um, that's going to do that. We currently see, for example, that if we were to scale up um, these productions, we're setting this facility up in, um, in Silicon Valley, actually, and then we're going to replicate that um, into our key production centers around the world. Um, that we would be able to efficiently produce, um, um, you know, uh, plant-based proteins and hybrid proteins um, at a scale of about maybe um, 20 times more efficient um, than traditional kind of uh, uh, industrial manufacturing of even plant-based proteins. Um, so I think um, I'm very hopeful for what's happening in the world, excited with the pace of change and where technology is going. Um, and with that, I don't, I, I didn't take I didn't record how much time I was taking, but um, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'll hand the, the, the floor back to the moderator. Thank you, Kakuta. Uh, you are only like one minute over time, so that's no problem. Oh, we still, okay. <laughs> we're still somewhat uh, in, in line with our time, Ryan. So thank you so much, Kakuta. That was very exciting stuff and the work in the blue carbon, seaweed, uh, kelp, etc. I was just actually uh, watching the, the FAO the documentary the other day on, on seaweed, but also uh, the 23rd uh, Sustainability in Action Plan. Let's do on the topic, uh, what you're doing to reduce climate change, uh, both within outward operations, new operations, and the, the value chain. Uh, and also the other stuff that uh, CBF has been doing for quite some time, right, on the reforestation, deforestation, both for mangrove and for, for the terrestrial forest. Great. Uh, Kun Pari Pong, Kap, Chai Kap Pong. All right. Thank you, Kap Kun Pong, Kap. Um, have you seen my screen? I, I just share my screen. Yes. Um, it's it's upcoming. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, as the well called the new era of the accelerated action. Okay. So we we take several steps of improving our um, our business in terms of getting look more transparent and then sustainable going to the future. Um, what, what we have called 2030 sustainability in action. All right. Um, if you look at the screen, we use the philosophy of sufficient economy that's from the King Rama the nine and combine data with the three benefit principle within CP group so that both of these come together to create the three core pillars of the sustainability in action in 2030 that, um, CBF will be a carbon neutral business. So that several actions have been taken and also will be taken in order to reduce the carbon emission in the future. If you look at the three 
core pillar of sustainability in action. One is the food security, all right? We have three action imperatives. So we call sustainable, sustainable food, responsible marketing, and the animal welfare, all right? Today, I will not talk about this because our key focus will be around the climate and waste, water and waste um, reduction. The second pillar is a self-sufficient economy, self-sufficient society. So the pillar or the, the core imperative for this sustainability in action, they are the human rights, lifelong learning, and the social impact, okay? And lastly is the balance of nature, okay? So they are the climate, waste, and water excellence, responsible sourcing for the planet, which is and the, um, the, 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 the third one that we need to focus on so that the reduction of the carbon along the whole supply chain. And lastly is the waste to value, or in other words, we convert the waste in the manufacturing process and try to return it to value. The whole action imperatives said above, they are controlled and managed by the sustainability governance using the UN SDG and 10 principle of the UN Global Compact, all right? So that the whole activities that we are taking will lead us to what the net zero of carbon in the next 2030 or in the next few years. All right, if we focus on the climate, West water and West action plan. There are two key areas that we are working on, decarbonization and carbon removal, all right? In the decarbonization, we'll be looking at the operational excellence or operational efficiency, climate-friendly products, renewable energy, transportation, and carbon removal. We are talking about deforestation and afforestation and reforestation. These are the key activities that happen in CPF right now in order to minimize the carbon emission and try to get the um, carbon um, greenhouse gas emission within control in 2030. All right, um, decarbonization, the key activities that we put on there are four key areas. That what we call four key areas of improvement. First, we call operational efficiency. So right now, we put the CPF automation and Internet of Things into our feed farm and the factories so that we call them the smart feed, smart farm, and the smart factory. The key implementation of this automation and IoT is to improve the water usage and to reduce the waste, all right? Because we know that in our feed and farm and the factory, we consume a lot of water and we produce um, a lot of waste into the environment so that the automation and IoT that we put in to our feed, our farm and the factory, so we will make our business getting smarter by improving the water usage and reducing the water. Secondly, what we are looking in the decarbonization, decarbonization is a renewable energy. Our target in CPF is we will be a coal-free business in 2022. Or the other one, we are eliminating the use of coal within our boiler, within our um, heat generating equipment. So what replaces the coal? Uh, we are working on the biomass system, installing within our factories and within our farm in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. Right now, we can reduce about 20,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year by using the biomass as a renewable energy. Thirdly, renewable energy in biogas. In our swine and layer farms, we have more than 100 locations that we install 
the biogas within our farm and the facility in order to utilize the gas generating from the biogas process to produce the heat, to produce the hot water using within the process. So this biogas renewable energy can reduce the greenhouse gas emission at 490,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. It is a huge and massive within our business using the biogas within our spine and layer farm. And lastly, um, this picture is an example of our wells. So right now, the renewable energy that we put in to our warehouse, our factory, is the solar energy. We install solar rooftop to our farm and floating. We have 110 locations and produce 47 megawatt so that we can reduce the greenhouse gas emission at 30,000 tons of carbon equivalent per year. Those are the key area of decarbonization and we'll be doing until we reach the target at 2030 for carbon neutral business. And lastly, is the afforestation and reforestation. In 2020, we have more than 10,000 right of the, of the forest that um, we put back the forest or we restore the condition of the trees and the plant to bring them to the soil. If you look at the picture to the left, it is in Lokuri, 2016 at Mountain Khao Priya Dengong, all right? This project, we jointly working with the villager and the people living around so that we improve the forests and, and put back the trees and put back the green condition. So within 2020, this is the right picture that you see right now. So we reduce more than 16,000 tons of CO2, all right? And then we set the target by 2030 there will be more than 20,000 rice. Then we will reduce more on the 200,000 tons of carbon, carbon dioxide. At this moment, we are working around three to four projects all together in order to generate the green back into our land or in other words, to restore the forest and, and even put more trees into the empty land so that our nature will come back to normal and we can reduce the carbon emission within our country. All right, and that's all. Thank you from CPF. Thank you very much, Kun Pirong Kap. That was very clear and very uh, hopeful that uh, you know, large company, a large food company like CPF is doing a lot of things uh, to improve the energy efficiency, uh, increase the renewable uh, energy uh, consumption and also uh, working in the, the nature based solution side of thing, uh, reforestation, afforestation. Uh, and the last person on our uh, uh, panel uh, with Mr. Ho Ren Hua from Taiwan. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, uh, but uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, first of all, Taiwan has uh, been very uh, well known uh, in working with uh, farmers within your value chain. Uh, it's a great example of helping other people, uh, suppliers, uh, raise productivity and reduce waste, improve the overall sustainability performance, right? Uh, so can you tell us about your strategies and example and how you work uh, with the, the farmers to reduce climate impact and improve their climate resilience? And also I heard that uh, uh, Taiwan is also actively working with uh, bioplastics. So if you can mention uh, a few words about bioplastics, how it can help, uh, you know, reduce pollution and uh, improve on the uh, climate impact of your know, packaging material, et cetera. Uh, what kind of impact are you hoping for for your bioplastic initiative? Good, good morning, hey, Kap, please. So thank you, Kap. Uh, let me just show a couple of quick slides and then I'll you know, do a voiceover to the two questions uh, in regards to you know, working with farmers and then second one in regards to bioplastics. Um, so first of all, essentially, Taiwan, we are a regional company. Um, we've got 15 operations across five countries. So Thailand is the base, um, but across Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, and China, we've got 15 operations. 
And essentially the core value as a B2B ag food company is to create value from farm to shelf. Um, as Kundan mentioned, I think there's a big need to catalyze innovation across the value chain. So a lot of Taiwan's approach is pretty much to look at different sectors of where we play in, in terms of building different innovations and different upstream catalysts. So we look at the four falls under Taiwan CSV, or we call CSV creating shared value. Uh, the first is farm, uh, second is factory, uh, third is family, and lastly is food. So moving from left to right, I'll just speak a bit more about the different verticals that Taiwan aims to develop impact and sustainability into our strategy. Currently, we work with over uh, 10 to 12,000 farmers daily on a daily basis across the Indochina region and more than 30 to 40,000 farmers indirectly across the ASEAN community. And working with farmers primarily in the tapioca, rice, mung bean space, I think there are a couple of things that they are ultimately looking for. Obviously, the first thing is stability of income and predictability of yield. With all the changes every day that you see in weather and drought, floods in Thailand, it's you know, almost impossible to 100% predict the future. But to the extent that we can de-risk some of the seasonality in terms of predicting 70, 80% of weather trends, understanding how to de-risk uh, flooding situations, understanding different movement patterns between farmers, we've been making a big effort to see how we can sustain a lot more in terms of the farm side. So focusing on the farm development and farm and factory has been a big part of our strategy over the last uh, couple of years. Two key examples is that we pioneered about two years ago, uh, working with KTB Bank to pioneer the first uh, smart card farming. So typically uh, farming or tapioca farming in Thailand used to be a cash transaction where it's uh, you know, pretty cumbersome and pretty uh, logistically challenging uh, for the farmers. So we started by rolling out uh, smart farming and digital farming for the farmers where now essentially they can swipe a uh, cash card and then you know, get the produce to the producers. Secondly, we rolled out uh, a range of different farm initiatives, including uh, organic farming, including can greenhouses, including own solar panels. And the real aim is to see how, you know, across the farm community, producers and tapioca companies, we can really drive a lot more innovation on the upstream part. And this ultimately increases in yield for the farmers and more importantly, in a more sustainable value chain. So the upstream part of working with the farmers has been a very important part of our philosophy over the last couple of years. We've replicated models that we've done in Thailand and now brought it to different parts of the world. For example, we've been doing the same farming with a partner in Cambodia in terms of organic rice and organic tapioca. We are piloting uh, new initiatives in Myanmar where we're working with local cooperatives to look at increasing yields. So across the Indochina region, we think there's a huge opportunity to actually enable and empower farmers to increase yields and also the efficacy of the incomes. A bit on agriculture inputs on this slide, if you look at some of the agriculture inputs in this part of the region, what goes into the farm and into the soil is also equally important. Kundan, I think, you know, mentioned very correctly that we really need to think a lot harder about regenerative agriculture across the ASEAN region. Every different soil region has a different organic matter profile, has a different pH profile, has a different use case, whether it's for tapioca, it's for sugarcane, it's for rice, it's for palm. So really understanding the different soil efficacy at different parts of Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia is something that we're actively looking at. And we really want to be one of the leaders in Thailand and the region to build a much more sustainable agriculture model. Next slide. So this is in regards to the green factory. So currently we've got eight operations uh, around uh, Thailand and three operations overseas. So the eight operations are located all across Thailand. Most of the operations now we have completely enabled with wastewater to energy uh, and um, in terms of developing the carbon offset strategy. By next year, we'll be looking to measure and benchmark all our GHG emissions across different parts of the value chain. We also pioneered two things. One is wastewater to energy in terms of you know, reconverting the methane back to electricity. And the second thing in terms of actually converting the pulp, the tapioca pulp back to energy itself. So the whole theme of energy, uh, of waste to energy, and the whole theme of reducing the carbon footprint at the factory level is definitely one thing that we are taking a very close look at. We've extended that a bit more into other parts of the value chain. So for example, looking at solar rooftops installed on two of our factories and finally moving a bit more faster into sustainable packaging and bioplastics. Next. So finally, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about bioplastics. Um, what Taiwan is doing by the end of this year is that we're launching the first uh, tapioca-based uh, bioplastics uh, in Southeast Asia at scale. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is to use uh, starch-based and starch-based compounds 
to develop different types of bioplastic solutions. So cassava starch, as you know, has been typically used uh, for many, many years, primarily for food grade and paper grade. But we've developed a model and a technology where we actually can use it for cassava packaging. It goes into different streams. So for example, you've got flexible films, you've got agricultural films, you've got motor fiber packaging. But the key idea is that by developing a full value stream from cassava starch into cassava packaging, being able to compost it, the byproduct then flows through on a full circular loop to actually drive a lot more value across the eco chain. We've developed this model in Thailand. We'll be launching at the end of the year. And we will be hoping to extend this uh, product to different parts of the world. The primary markets that we think in the next two to three years will be Thailand, Vietnam, East Asia, and certainly key parts of the US and Europe, where the need for biodegradable compostable solutions will be much more unique. Another point is that tapioca-based bioplastics is pretty versatile. It can be combined with other types of biopolymers as well. So we've been spending about two years in R&D to blend different types of tapioca-based bioplastic compounds with different types of plant fibers, different types of biopolymers, to really see how we can develop a much stronger packaging solution to our customers uh, all over the world. Next. Rosecco Packaging is, a, is, is our first project name that will be launching later this year. And again, I think there are a couple of different elements of this. Uh, first, I think, you know, once we actually take a plant, uh, tapioca cassava, to develop an industrial grade product, uh, in terms of being much more environmentally friendly, in terms of heat resistance, mechanical properties. We're developing a whole new business model where out of tapioca, we can actually take a very key source of carbohydrates and a key source of um, uh, a cassava starch to make it far more value-add in actually solving the equation around plastics waste and solving the equation around reducing carbon footprint. So that's all in all the Taiwan's overall strategy in regards to CSV, uh, creating shared value. Uh, the four key pillars are around farm, factory, uh, family, and food. What we are doing ultimately is really to see what we can do in our part of the value chain, all the way upstream in terms of agriculture, down to the factory, down to downstream in terms of ingredients, and finally launching biopackaging this year. Thank you, Kap. Thank you so much, Kap. Mr. Horan Pua from Taiwan. That was very exciting. Uh, uh, you mentioned regenerative agriculture. I think that word has been thrown around uh, for quite some time lately. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting uh, area that we all need to be looking at and scaling up. Uh, and also mentioning uh, the bioplastic, uh, thank you for your clarification and uh, the direction that you're heading. So that was very exciting development. And we have a few minutes left uh, towards the end. Uh, we have a few questions also from the floor that I've uh, been forwarded uh, from the organizer. Uh, there are a few questions that are uh, quite broad, but there's one more generic question that I would like to direct to Mr. Ole. Uh, could Ole grab, uh, there's a question about uh, how many farmers you know, have benefited from this program so far and how many farmers, uh, I think you mentioned the revolving fund to help farmers uh, you know, get this started. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Yes, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it's, it's our target to, to reach uh, around 100,000 uh, farmer households in the six provinces. Uh, you know, during the, the last one and a half year, uh, we have to admit that we have been, uh, we have come uh, behind schedule due to the COVID restrictions both in terms of, of traveling and but also in terms of a gathering of farmers. So that means that that, uh, that our ac training activities uh, of farmers and, uh, and field, uh, field trials, they have been restricted due to uh, the COVID restrictions. And, and therefore, uh, so far, we have uh, reached around uh, 20,000 farmers. Uh, but uh, we are still optimistic that uh, by the end of the project, we will reach the 100,000 farmers. And, and, and what we have been uh, working on is, uh, you know, we, we work through, we train uh, lead farmers or what we call uh, farmer volunteers, who then again uh, work with and, and train uh, other farmers in their local communities. And, and now, uh, thanks to COVID, we have been uh, adjusting our strategies where we also uh, develop what we call uh, e-extension tools, which includes uh, YouTube videos, 
which can uh, be used by uh, these elite farmers and uh, uh, and vo uh, volunteer farmers in their work uh, with with other farmers. Uh, uh, so so we have uh, quite a few farmers which uh, have been uh, applying, especially the alternate wetting and drying, the site-specific nutrient management, and also uh, which are uh, selling rice straw. However, as I mentioned, the uptake of the uh, laser land leveling is still at a very uh, rudimentary stage due to the investment cost. And, and in this regard, uh, we can say actually as it stands now, we have uh, far more farmers interested than service providers who are able to do uh, to, to provide the service for farmers. Uh, we have very few, far, uh, uh, let's say, service providers who have invested in the technology yet. And that's because they, they are still want to see uh, other service providers successfully building up a business before they themselves take the investment, system, uh, the, the investment decision. So, so we also face the problem that we have very little supply and, and that's why we are now working uh, or discussing the, uh, the, the possibility of introducing a subsidy for both service providers to make the investments, but also for farmers to, uh, to, to uh, do the, the laser land leveling. Thank you, Kun Ole. And finally, finally, I'll ask uh, the remaining three panelists to uh, wrap up in 30 seconds or less. Uh, 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 starting with uh, Kun Ho Ren Hua, please. Thank you. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the long-term purpose and goals for all of us are shared and very similar. It's ultimately to decarbonize. It's ultimately to create more sustainable and more innovative solutions. Uh, for Thai, we're very focused in terms of farm to shelf, working very closely to farmers, soil, agriculture. I look forward to working and collaborating with many of you in the months and years to come. Thank you, Club. Thank you, Club, uh, Mr. Horan Hua. Uh, next, uh, Kun Dan, Club. 30 seconds. Yes, so um, I, I think uh, people don't understand what's going to happen when climate change and regulation affects Thailand. And I would like to say that it's going to hit and it's going to hit hard and it's going to hit a lot sooner. So go back, re-examine your business because it's, it's, it's coming, change is coming and for the better. Um, don't view it as a threat, view it as an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Dan. And finally, Kun uh, Peter Pong, Captain. Thank you, Captain Fung. Um, I think for us, the 2030 is not that far. It's not very far, it's just in the next few years. And as Kundan mentioned, it will hit us hard. And actually with some warning, we have been warned about this for, for quite a while, all right? And for CPF, we have 2030, the sustainability in action. And we know that we still have many things to do in order to achieve that goal. And we learned that actually the actions that we have been doing is not enough to bring us down to that level that we want to achieve in 2030. So that in CVF ourselves, we are acting very hard to do more in order to achieve the goal. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up this session. Uh, we are just about on time. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Horan Hua, Kun Dan, Kun Ole, and Kun Pierre Pong. There's still some questions, and I'll try to answer them in the public room. So thank you very much again, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the panelists and, of course, the moderator, 